Okay, uh, my name is Ross Baker. Um, I'm a contributor to several type-level projects. Uh, two of those are CATS and HTTP for S, which I'll be speaking about quite a bit here. Uh, I work for a company called Formation. Greg told you all about it this morning. So I wanted to give an example based on an option to start with, and I thought, well, being in Philadelphia, I'll talk about sandwiches with and without, but I decided that might be too controversial here in Philadelphia. <laughs> so we're going to talk about something I know pretty well, and that's hockey. It turns out that some hockey teams have a captain. Here in Philadelphia, you've got Giroux. In Boston, you've got Chara. In some cities, you don't have a captain. So this is modeled very well with an option. You've got some or you've got none. When we're building up a database application, we're typically pulling from the database, we're applying a data transformation pipeline to the database, and we're rendering the result. And this should be no surprise to most people. Whenever we map over a sum, we always get a sum back out. No matter how many times we map, we can create this pipeline of multiple operations. When a sum comes in, a sum comes out. If we try to do that over the Rangers captain, who is none, we get a none back out. Now let's change gears a little bit. If we're building a database application, we should also be thinking about asynchrony so we can make a nice web scale application. So we're going to change our encoding. Instead of having an option where we're going to represent some captain or none, we're going to have a future. And teams that have a captain, those will be represented with a future success that holds the player. And teams that don't have a captain will be represented as a future failure. We need something to shove in that failure, so it will be a no such element exception. And this, even though we swapped out our effect, we're still able to use the exact same pipeline. We can still cross-check it, we can still slash it, we can still render the player. And we see the same phenomenon here. We see that when we have a success coming in, a success comes back out. And when we have a failure coming in, a failure comes back out. That's a key point on map, is that it doesn't change the structure of what it's mapping over. Now, we've made a good case for having an option for our database. We've made a good case for having a future for our database. Why not both? A naive way of doing this is we can take our option and we can nest it directly inside the future. For convenience, we're going to create a type alias here, call it future option. And we can define our DAO object to nest things. So we see that now the future success, that governs whether the database call succeeded or not, and then we've got the option as to whether the team has a captain or not. We've got a little bit richer model this way. We model both effects. We've separated those concerns. The problem with this is that it's changed our rendering pipeline. We couldn't just transparently swap out that effect anymore. Now, it's true that map doesn't care about what structure it's mapping over, but it cares deeply about what's inside of what you're mapping over. And now, instead of having a player to map over, it's suddenly got an option to map over. It doesn't matter what kind of box you have, but it matters a lot that now you've got two boxes. There's something else in the way when we do this. And as people start to stack effects for the first time, they're just desperate to get it to compile, and you end up seeing a lot of code like this. You can see this is kind of baby's first steps as they start to nest effects. You'll see map map all over your code, and then as you're building up the pipeline, well, it worked once, we're going to do it again. Map map, map map, map map. And as you get a little bit more comfortable with this technique, you can observe, OK, well, I can take all those inner maps, I can smush those together, I still need that one outer map, it's a little better, but it's still not as transparent as what we had when we had a single effect. CATS has a really nice type for this called nested, where you can take two container types and you can put them together as type parameters, and nested is going to wrap around those. We can see here in the two string output of it, we're going to pay the cost of having an extra wrapper around our types. But what that nested wrapper is going to do, we got the future and the option, just like we had before, but with this nested wrapper around it, we can call a single map and it will map over both effects for us. Why does that work? That works because functors compose. Everything we've been talking about so far is a functor. And a functor, what is that? Well, there's a formal definition of that with laws. I think what we can say for the purposes of this talk is that it's anything that you can map over and it's anything that you can map over that's not a set and it's not a Spark data frame. For the most part, everything else <laughs> with a map is a functor. 
And how does this nested work? Let's see if we can implement that signature ourselves. And it turns out we can, and it's not too surprising what it looks like. What we said is we had two effects and two maps, and we were turning them down into one. Well, if we look at the implementation here, we've got one map here, and that's represented by a double map here. So it's just abstracting out that double map call that we had before and putting it into that nested type. That works because functors are pretty basic, because it doesn't need to know anything about the container other than the fact that you're in those functors. This works. Now let's progress on to sequential computations. We're going to do a little bit more sophisticated query here. I want to know how many points Philadelphia's captain has scored. And that requires two calls to the database. First of all, I need to know who Philadelphia's captain is. And then you can see down here in the stats call, we need to know who that captain is so we can use their name as an ID to look up the information that we need. And this is something where since you've got two calls that return a future option, it's not necessarily going to be the case that your implementation of the future option is going to be the same. The first call could succeed and the second call fails because you don't have stats or because the database went down in between. This is a more complicated operation. And because it's a more complicated operation, it's not supported on as many types. It turns out that flat map is not available on a nested. Why is that? It's because monads don't compose. Now look out at the room right now when I say monads don't compose. I see some angry reactions to that. That we're sold functional programming is composable. Everything is supposed to be great about monads. <laughs> and now there's this bozo up here telling me that monads don't compose. What's the deal? It turns out you can compose them with some magic, so let's try. Let's not give up so easily. So what I did was I set out to try to add the flat map operation to the nested class. And I got this far until my head hurt, and then I used the triple quote operator that we saw earlier in Adam's talk. So this works up to the point of magic. So we can make monads compose, but all we need to do is we need to take a g of f of g of b and turn that into an f of g of b. How in the world do we do that? Well, one thing that jumps to mind right away is if I see two G's together and I see that I've got a monad, if I could flip that F and G around and get those two G's together, I can flatten those two G's. That's a property of monads, is you can always flatten those. So we can reduce our problem there by having an extra flatten call off to the side. And now our magic is reduced to a G of F of B to an F of G of B. This is a somewhat more familiar problem. And the answer is always... Traverse, very good. So wh where we had a flat map before on the G of A, we have a traverse. To do that, we had to add an extra constraint to the G. So you can nest monads, but the inner monad has to be a traversable monad. If it satisfies that traverse type class, then we're able to flip this. We can see that this compiles. And then we'll go ahead and try to run that code that we had before. And lo and behold, it works. So that's a really neat party trick, but that's still an anemic monad. It's not a lot of fun to use. Why is that? So when we're building up a future option, presumably we want to do something about that none case before we're done. And to eliminate that option, it's buried there very deeply now. It's nested really tells the tale. You've got to unnest it with that FGA call, and then you've got to map into the future the results, and only then can you call the git or else. So the pipeline ends up still being pretty deep once you start to do real operations on it. So we're going to take a step back and introduce the concept of monad transformers. So it's a compromise between generality and convenience. We're going to lose being general for any kind of traversable monad. We're going to specialize this type on option. But by specializing it on option, we're able to get all of those other operations on top of it. So we can see that the get or else is here. And when you use an option T, I'm glad other people explained kind projector. Now I'm not going to have to. We've seen that syntax a few times now. We can see that we could call get or else directly on the option T. So this is a lot more convenient to use. So I'd use the term monad transformer. Let's really explain what a monad transformer is. I'd like to define it rigorously. And by defining it rigorously, I mean I'd like to explain the first sentence of the Wikipedia article on it. <laughs> so a monad transformer is a type constructor which takes a monad as an argument and returns a monad as a result. Well, what's a type constructor? A type constructor is something that takes a type as an argument and it returns a type. So that part highlighted in red, that's our type constructor. We take an A and we're able to derive a new type. 
takes a monad as an argument. So we can see things highlighted in blue here. It takes a monad as an argument, as its other type parameter, and we can see that it's necessary because we're flat mapping over it. And returns a monad as a result. So to have a monad, we've got the pure, we've got the flat map, and they also have to behave together lawfully, which, trust me, this one does. Neat. Can we do this for any kind of monad? Well, no, not every monad is traversable. Future T, people ask, well, can I have a future T? And this code compiles, but it compiles with unutterable horror. That's right here, uh, you're blocking threads indefinitely. If your operation fails, you're throwing exceptions. So this compiles, but this does not pass all the laws that are necessary. So you will not find a traverse instance for future in cats, and therefore you will also not find a future T in cats. And if you find one in a code review, please reject it. So what are some other interesting ones that we can create? Well, there is either T. That's one that is traversable, and that exists. Let's steer the conversation toward HTTP a bit. With either T, let's build up an error type. We're going to build up a rejection, reasons that our routing might fail. So we're just going to have a couple in this example. The real reasons that an HTTP request might fail are much broader than this, but this will suffice for an example that fits on a slide. It can fail because you tried to request something with the wrong method, or it can fail because you had a required query parameter and you didn't provide it. Those will be our rejections for our ADT. We're going to create a type alias here just to make things a little bit more convenient. What we're going to say is a result T is anything that can fail with either a rejection or succeed with value A inside of an F. And then we've got a couple smart constructors here, success and reject, makes the code read a little bit better. Down here, we can take our DSL that we've built up. We're going to have a git, and we're going to have a query param. So git is going to say, if my request method is git, pass it through, and we'll uh, output a method. And then query param, it's going to look up that query parameter on the request. And if it's there, it will pass it through. Otherwise, it will reject it with a missing query parameter. You'll note in this code that we don't ever see the reject being called. We define the rejections, but we don't reject. The reason is, nowhere in this code do we have any evidence of a request. So what we've done is we've built up this nice DSL for creating a response, but it doesn't depend on a request. We've built up a static response. So this is inadequate to express what we need. There's another monad transformer out there called reader T, the transformation over the reader monad. It's more commonly known as Kleisley, named after a Swiss mathematician. And that uses Kleisley effects, and what Kleisley is, is whereas either T is about handling errors inside of an effect, Kleisley is about making function calls that return an effect. Now, we've got to change a few things to make this work. Well, first of all, down here in our Kleisley, since I said that's a function call, we get access to a request. So the second type parameter on Kleisley, that's the input type to our function. So we're building up functions of request. That's good. Since we have functions of request, now we can respond appropriately and verify that the method is correct, extract the query parameter. That all works now. But we had to make some other compromises on this. We've lost our typed air channel. So the Fs that we're talking about dealing with here in practice are going to be things like cat's effect IO or monarch's avail task. Those are going to be things that handle all kinds of exceptions, and they handle them in a throwable air channel. So what we've had to do is we've had to make our rejection extend throwable. It wasn't previously an exception. It was just an air type. Now we've had to make it something that can be thrown. And we have to take as evidence this applicative error f-throwable that we just saw in Chris's talk. And we fail down into that channel that's untyped. So to the Java programmers out there, this is like declaring throws exception. We have lost all typing on what our errors are. Whoever recovers this is going to have to be able to deal with any kind of throwable at this point. We do see that our fundamental DSL is unchanged, though. That's kind of neat. So either T versus Kleisley. Either T, it was really nice to have the typed air channel. Kleisley, it was nice to actually have a request, so we've got a dynamic service rather than a static site generator. Why not both? And a principle with monad transformers is that you can nest them. You can start to stack your effects. So since a monad transformer takes a monad as an input, and it produces a monad as an output, that monad that it outputs can be the input type to another monad transformer. 
And what we introduce here is we are going to call a new type directive where our Cliesley, instead of it being over f to request of f to a, we're going to embed the result t inside of that. We're stacking up right here, we're stacking the result t on top of our base monad f. And when we do that, we can bring back the success and reject just like we had before. And we can call our get and query param, those have access to a request just like they did before. That hasn't changed. And what we get is we get a nicely typed air channel. So let's take our DSL again to build up our request extractor and say hello world. And then we're going to define this run method. One really neat thing about this either T-based DSL is now that we know that we have to handle rejections, we can be better HTTP citizens. Not only do we know that our routing failed, we know why it failed and we can respond with an appropriate code. This run only needs to be defined up at the top level, it doesn't need to be defined everywhere. So we define a run helper to take our result T and turn that into a final response that seals things off, brings it back to an F of response. Let's see, does it work? Well, when we call git without the required query parameter, we get a 400 response, bad request, that's traditional when you're missing a query parameter. When we called it with an unsupported method, we see that we get the 405 status code, that's correct from an HTTP perspective. And then when we call git and we provide the necessary query parameter, it turns out we get an OK. I didn't show the body here, but it's 13 characters, so hello gritty 13, all right. So some of you may be experiencing a case of deja vu at this point. So you look at this type, and maybe this type looks a little bit familiar to you. Or maybe this boring guy up at the front who's wearing the same old red hat and droning on and on, maybe he looks familiar to you. So last year I talked about this library and explained how we can take uh, Scala's partial functions when they return something in an F context, and we can turn that into a Cliesley over option T. So we described this. This is a traditional HTTP for S DSL. This is what probably 98% of the HTTP for S apps out there use. But what we're able to do is we've taken an entirely new monad transformer and plugged it into that point. And a really important part of HTTP for S that I talked about last year is that independent of what your effect type is, whether you're using IO or whether you're using Monix task or whether you're stacking things up in option or using a pure transformer, I'm sorry, if you're using a pure effect or if you're stacking it up now in this either T, you're able to abstract over the Cliesley and the fact that that first parameter is a monad, you're able to build all these other things for free. You've got middlewares to do compression for you, you've got middlewares to do metrics, you've got middlewares for logging, CSRF protection. All of those are abstracted over the Cliesley and not over the monad that is in that first position. So by writing this new DSL that we hadn't thought of until I got accepted for this talk, this is something that you are able to get for free participating in this ecosystem. Uh, one thing I should mention, I don't know if it was on my footnotes, if you like this either based DSL, there's a project called HTTP for S Directives that implements that DSL. It's already out there. It's got a little bit more syntactic sugar on it, but it's that same basic concept. And that concept actually was originated way back here in 2013. They gave a talk on unfiltered directives. It's the same concept. It's a very old DSL, but now it's been ported into this functional world. Let's take it a step further and see if we can do ACA-like routing. So one thing that we had with that previous DSL that was either T-based is everything was unidirectional. So at every step along the way, you could extract a little bit more information about the request. You've got maybe the method that it used, you can extract query parameters, you could even decode the body. Every step of the way, you're getting a little bit more information about the request, and then you're passing it off to the next step to eventually generate that response. All the data flows in one direction. Can we make a more general HTTP pipeline with this? And the answer to that in ACA is yes. So ACA HTTP routing looks a little bit like this. This is kind of a mashup. This isn't quite ACA HTTP. This isn't quite HTTP for S, but this is a rough target. Can we do something like this? The inner routes that we have here with the git and the query param, that's that same request pipeline that we had before. None of that has changed. The nesting of it has changed, but what we're doing with that has not changed. We're going to add this new directive on the outside called powered by. What powered by is going to do is it's going to add an X powered by header to every response that comes back out. And this is what I mean about the bidirectional bi processing is 
we can see everything else was flowing downhill, so what we had was something that fit into the previous DSL, but if we want to transform the response on the way back out, we didn't really have the capacity to do that. If you look at this and you're familiar with continuations, we see that this is continuation passing style. And this was something that was recently added to CATS. I think it's new in CATS 1.6. It's CONT T. It's the monad transformer over continuations. So we're going to have a couple type aliases. The result T and route look just like they did before, but we're going to introduce this new CONT T, and we're going to call it a directive, just like ACA HTTP does. What does that mean? So a CONT T with all these type parameters, it's going to be something that accepts a continuation. So that third parameter is going to be the input to the continuation. And then it's going to need to respond with a route. And so it's that first parameter. And then to fill in the question mark, it's the second parameter. Kind of a strange ordering, but that's what's going on. You're taking a continuation that takes in an A and returns in a route that returns a response. And then what the directive is going to be able to do is it's going to be past that continuation and it's going to calculate an intermediate A, and it can call that continuation with the A to get that route of response. Or it doesn't have to call that continuation. It's totally up to the directive whether it calls it, or it can even call it multiple times, whatever it wants to do. But the constraint on it is it has to return a route of F of response. Now, there's so many type aliases floating around here, it might help to expand this out. What we're really building up with this, through all these stacked effects, is ultimately we're building up a function from a request to an F that is either going to be a rejection or a response. What CONT-T does is it lets us build it up in this monadic fashion. So here's what I'm calling ACA for HTTP for S. <laughs> <laughs> so what we see here with our query param and our git is they look approximately like they did before. I'm sorry about the indentation. I had to fit it all on one slide. One thing, all the slides that you see here, they compile. These are all live examples, thanks to Tut. So thank you, Rob. So we've taken our Cleisleys that we had before, and now we've had to wrap it in a cont T. And the key observation here is that when you've got this extra wrapper, you see that the Cleisley is another parameter there. We've got full control over that Cleisley. Once we added this continuation, it's a little bit more complex, but it's also more powerful. So the query param, that's not really that interesting. It looks just like we did before, except we take that continuation and then we run on it. The powered by is something that we couldn't implement in that previous DSL. The powered by, what we do is we take the Cleisley that's part of the continuation, we invoke the continuation with what we have, and then we map over the result of the continuation. And what the result of that is, is we're taking a route and we're transforming that into another route. So the difference is, instead of building up a response iteratively, we're building up the entire HTTP function step by step. And then complete it just as something that completes the type Tetris for us, so to speak, where we give it a response and it lifts it into the route type. And what we have here is we have almost the same DSL. So on cont t, what Akka called the, uh, apply, the cont t calls run. So we've had to add a bunch of run calls into this. We also, for type inference reasons, by virtue of being a compiling presentation, we had to put this I.O. here. There are certain tricks that we can do that are not very TUT friendly. If we were doing this for real, those I.O.s could disappear. This is that same basic DSL that we had before. And we call it with the same request that we had before. And sure enough, we get a response. Status is 200, content length 13, just the size of Hello Gritty. And there we go, X powered by the Cont T Monad Transformer. So ACA HTTP, all it is is a continuation transformer over an either T transformer with a Cleisley over a request. <laughs> all right, bonus musings in case I talk too fast. And as I look up at the clock, yes, I did talk too fast. So we can go over some of these. Uh, some other monad transformers that are out there in CATS are IORT. So IORT is very similar to either T. First of all, it helps. Who's familiar with IOR? Okay, I see a minority of hands. So IOR is kind of like either, but the difference is with either you have either A or you have either, sorry, you have either A or B. It can be a left or it can be a right, but it can't be both. IOR has this third state where it can be both A and B. What is that useful for? That's useful for non-fatal errors. So 
On the right side, you still have values in IOR, just like you do with either. But if you have values that you're not happy about returning, if you want to pass along some warnings along with it, you can put those on the left. You can say both. It's like kind of like having a signing statement when you sign a bill. It's, I do this, but I object to doing this. Here's some things that you might want to know about. And with that IORT, we could build up something that had the gathered warnings about your API. If people were calling deprecated endpoints, or if we had to say, okay, you didn't explicitly pass a character set. Uh, we figured out what you meant, but in the future, you should be explicit about that. Be a better HTTP citizen as a client. You'd be able to express that, and then we could have the same kind of DSL that would build up your result and also return you a list of warnings, which you would then need a standard rendering for, either as part of a JSON payload or a custom header. That would be API dependent. HTTP doesn't have anything to say about that. But you could do something like that. Writer T, that's another uh, monad transformer that we have. I tried to think of a good example for Writer T. And I think the best advice I have for Writer T is generally it's really good for understanding monads, but it's not really good in practice. Writer T, especially when you've got something that can fail. So a writer, what it does is it captures a log of values along with your result. And those get tied together. You've got kind of a tuple of your log of values and your result with a writer. And when you're transforming that over a monad that can fail, what happens is when you have an exception, you don't have a value with which to attach your log to anymore. You're down there in that failed state, your log disappears. So a lot of people say use writer for logging, but just when you want your logging the most, when you have an error condition, that's when your writer T throws it away because it doesn't get carried along. So you could do that if you want an inadequate, irritating logging solution. You could build a DSL on writer T. I wouldn't. Uh, trace T by Mike Pilquist here, that's an interesting thing. If you really want to do tracing and figure out what's happening in your API, take a look at that. State T, we saw that one. Oh, sorry. It's Steve Buzzard, actually. Oh, Steve Buzzard, great. Awesome. State T, that is one that we saw in Mark's talk this morning. And state T is something that's really good for implementing sessions, except for the fact it isn't concurrent. Uh, you'd want to look at cat's effect ref, which fortuitously we heard about from Fabio here. Uh, I guess having non-concurrent sessions was good enough for the servlet API for 15 years. So if you really want to use state T, you could revisit that experience in a functional style. But no, <laughs> if you're doing stateful sessions, take a look at cat's effect ref instead. And if there are any other monad transformers that are out there, uh, if this spurred your thinking on that, I'd love to hear some other ideas on that as well. Okay, uh, this code will be posted there at that repo. If you're interested in HTTP for S, uh, you can come hack on that at that address. Uh, cats, we're always looking for people to help out on that. Uh, my Twitter is Ross A. Baker, and uh, I work on Scala and Haskell at Formation, and we're hiring. So if you're interested in that, come see me. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Any questions? You feel free to go. Sorry, I'm in an inconvenient spot. Um, so, one of the things that's sometimes a problem in Haskell when you're using lots of monad transforms is you'll have some action that's written for only part of your stack. That is, you've, you've managed to stack on top, you've managed to stack, say, a, a Kleisley on top of a, a Kant T or something, and you've got something else that is written just for a Kant T. And then Haskell, um, the usual solution is to define a type class that lets you lift stuff up appropriately appropriate number of times. What's the, the Scala solution for when you're, you've got something that's stacked three or four levels deep, you've got some function that deals with like two of the four things that you've got in your stack? Right, so there are a couple solutions for that. Uh, one of them, there's an MTL library for cats, it's called cats MTL. It's not something that is as widespread as it is in Haskell. It's uh, still not at a 1.0 release, so I think a lot of libraries like HTTP for S or other libraries in this ecosystem, they're afraid of using that. Uh, as far as using that in your own code, if you're willing to deal with the 0.x-ness of it, that can be a good solution to that problem. 
Uh, I have also heard of people inventing their own type classes for that to not create a dependency, but they know which stacks they need to go in and out of, so they might create their own type classes for that. It's probably a little bit more ad hoc solution to that than it is in Haskell. But uh, yeah, similar problems, similar solutions on that, I would say. I asked uh, him a hard question. He's going to come back at me. So, so a follow-up on this. Uh, so when can we expect the pull request to HTTP4S introducing this? <laughs> <laughs> well, if anybody would like to have this DSL that we talked about, any of these DSLs that we talked about or thought of one that's new, uh, we're very friendly on our Gitter channel. I would love to help mentor people, and so would several of the other friendly committers who are here. So please come join us. Any other questions? If not, we can set the computer up. And all the friendly committers, feel free to introduce yourself. We have a little time. Just stand up and say hi. Don't be shy. Hello again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.